in Sweden, joining together with all of you. The specific inspiration I felt today to speak about is about the topic of the most magic of all influences in history of existence. <coughs> that is the topic of Prema. Prema is the Indian Sanskrit word for the most exclusive and refined feeling in the heart which we usually translate with the word love. And what that could mean is this topic of my few words tonight. I request you please come in, sit a little bit, because there may be more people coming than they will not find a way inside. So in this area especially should be kept a little free. So as it is natural, this topic is very taxing as well as charming because what has not been said in the name of love, which, what has not been done in the name of love. You know, some people kill others, they say, because I love my fatherland, my motherland, therefore I feel now I have the right to encroach upon others and give them a hard time or devastate them. So. The ambiguousness of the term love is a little bit something like the like the word religion. Religion is also about love, love for God, love for the Creator, love for life, love for love. But the actual origin of the word religion is in Latin religare. And it actually refers to connecting ourselves to our homeward consciousness or our connection with our origin. It's a very technical term. It's very specific. And it has nothing to do with politics. And it has nothing to do with selfishness, abuse, or whatever. So that puts us in big trouble because as the word religion, religare, is being used for any silly thing nowadays, then people are grown tired of the word. I mean, there's some uh, open uh, groups, they say, our religion is getting money. They actually go, this is a little joke, but in America it's not a joke, people actually go to church and pray for money. <coughs> it's the money church, and if you want to have any success of getting money, you've got to give money to the church. Things like that, you know. But, you see, the word love has been abused such, just as much as the word religion has. But for some unique feature, we have not grown tired of the word. Because it touches something within us. It touches the very inner meaning of our existence. It's motivation. It's self-evident. It's a prime necessity. Now, when we study consciousness, 
it's a very important thing to study consciousness. Our modern society has committed the greatest of all blunder. We study everything in the world except consciousness. That we leave aside as if it is not important. So we study the chemistry, we study the physics, we study the biodynamics, we study the genetical uh, alterations which can be done, we study physical laws and sciences of all kinds, we study technology, we study astronomy, we study practically everything we can get hold of, our fingers, and we are very keen to dive into, write books about it, and pose ourselves as scholars on a certain type of field. But consciousness we have simply left it aside. And sometimes we have abbreviated our lack of research by drawing conclusions about consciousness which are usually just wishful thinking. They are not even any kind of scientific <coughs> evaluated or appreciated fact. Inasmuch that people say very commonly in our Western world, consciousness, when I die it's over. So when it's over, it's over, so why bother? It's finished. I'm now putting all my efforts into my senses while I'm alive. What happens to consciousness when I'm dead? This is meaningless to me. So in this way, consciousness is isolated into a ignored sphere. And the only thing we are preoccupied about is matter, which we study, and our studies have gone deep. Darwin thought the secret of life is in the cell. He really thought the cells are so fantastic, reproducing themselves and all this stuff, what they do. And really, at a certain combination of a certain amount of cells, consciousness arises. Magic. There it is, the guy. Then, when the cell studies became more profound, could understand, no, this cell is just a unique type of a sophisticated creation. So what animates it? Where does the energy come from which flows through the mechanism of a cell? The description has been given that the single functions within one cell can be equalized in number to all the functions, installations of light, water, telephone, heating, in a city of a size like Stockholm. All what's going on in Stockholm, that same amount of information transactions is flowing for and back in one of your cells on which you have billions. Gives you kind of a new type of idea, no? I mean, last but not least, information gives us a chance for evaluation, gives us a cha chance for assessment, and gives us a chance for criteria and conviction. In last instance of the faith you accept, the faith you embrace. So we cannot imagine how much has to be done in order to really understand the glory of consciousness. So when the cell was not a plausible explanation of the existence of consciousness, then the scientists moved on to the chemical evolution. They went to the amino acids and the proteins and how they form different 
structures. They said the secret of consciousness must be in a more finer substance. So they went to the chemical evolution and then they were seeing the, uh, the chemical processes and what do they do and what kind of sophistications they had. And very quickly they had to come to the conclusion that the chemical evolution, as far as arising consciousness is concerned, cannot be responsible of it. So then they started approaching the DNA to see whether the DNA could have anything to do with it. And it just goes on further and further and further. The particles of studies are becoming minor and minor and minor. But what we are knowing now about consciousness from the point of quantum physics, it is so fantastic that we can simply conclude that the mechanism in its most minimal reducible form of matter, the living entity, the unicellular. It is so complex in its own way that it cannot be a product which has not been preconceived. And that's what is being used as a backing for what we call intelligent design that if the most reducible function or a part combination of particles which produce a functioning unit which lives, if that is so refined and sophisticated, so perfect in place, that it is absolutely impossible that it just comes together by a kind of a uh, mixing up some substance and boom, they are together. Somebody in an evolutionary discussion he, in Yugoslavia a few years ago, he said, the probability for life being created by matter combining different elements is exactly as big as the probability of throwing a bomb into a junkyard and ending up with a 747 airplane as a result of it. Well, you got it? Only somebody who doesn't want to know the truth subscribes to such ideas because mathematically they are arbitrary proposals by the approach of science, not by the approach of faith. Approach of faith is another story altogether by the approach of science. So in quantum physics it goes even deeper than that because in quantum physics we are seeing that matter can evolve. It's like an empiric, it's like a, an, an ascending process which takes place in the interactions of matter. But matter, so to say, it develops in a, in a kind of sequential way. But there's something which collapses this development, and that supposed to be collapse, is something which comes from a higher energy, from a higher power. A higher power can come collapse, like uh, this is here, this came here, whatever way it came. Now this position can be collapsed, I pick it up. But there's a lot of energy moving, there's a lot of awareness for this to be picked up. So. Any type of situation collapses minutely and repeatedly in the contact with consciousness. Now, this is like a descent. Something is descending. And what descends? It's consciousness which descends upon matter and modifies it at its free will. And then how do you conclude that the ascending process starts controlling the descending process of higher influence? There is no connection. So quantum physics studies possibilities. Quantum physics says it's, 
It can be this way, it can be that way. There's a reducible approach to it, but finally there is a way. And this reducing, or this, uh, the, the possibilities which we see in the quantum physics, which cannot be any more put in numbers, they cannot be put any more in, 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 in a concrete formula, they lead us into the world of consciousness, and they lead us into a consciousness which is beyond time and space. That's another step. That's a quantum jump. No? Now, from the study of matter, we are studying something which is beyond time and space. My goodness, beyond time and space. And you must be almost flipping out. What? I mean, we are within space, we are within time, we are confined, apparently, and we are of the nature of something transcending time and space. Now, if you take a different approach, then you will understand that consciousness is something which existed before you were born, and it will exist after you death. The body is dead. So, why? Because what created you coming into existence was consciousness. And that what co is called death is simply the absence of that consciousness. And that consciousness has no limitations, no, it is not part of the production process of this. So to speak, it must be an independent existence beyond your being born and being dead. That's where it comes from life. So we are practically... We are crystallizing an understanding and scientific position of what's called in religion the soul. So where is the soul coming from? Oh, now we are approaching another world. Now we are approaching another realm. <coughs> and even quantum physicists start shaking. They say, what is the quantum leap into the origin of the soul? And that's where I come in today with my observations. I just gave this kind of uh, observation as an introduction. The, the real jump towards the influence of consciousness is not that consciousness which you may observe like a psychologist or like a psychiatrist who simply studies different stages of consciousness defense mechanism, traumas, uh, different stages of uh, inner urges, sensual urges, sexual impulse, uh, sense of security, like Maslow, one famous psychology, he, he, the being needs of man, you know, the the having needs, uh, the, all, the, all the elements which make a person what we notice them to be, all these urges and impulses. They are all kind of curious to study, and to a certain degree they make us cute, especially when we are small kids. And we see, oh, look, now he eats this, now he wants to eat, now he wants to sleep. Now, you see, everything when a child does it, it looks cute. When a big guy does it, nobody cares, you know. I mean, it's just like another one of those. Hmm? But anyhow, there is some cuteness towards those mechanisms, but there is something which is the absolute unique feature. That is so unique that it even works when you're old. That is your loving propensity. That loving propensity within us is the real characteristic of that soul beyond time and space. Now get that one. You are actually a loving powerhouse in potential. And that's really all you care about. But something happened. Something, whatever, 
terrible, strange, surprising. You were born on this beautiful planet, somewhere in space. Wow. I mean, this is more than surrealistic. Huh? This is this is this is more than artistic. This is more than scientific. You, that loving powerhouse, this little guy who just urges, beams. He's just like he's inside, totally. He he feels an infatuation for love from the very moment he was born, from the very first moment he grabs his mom. Is infatuated. You know, that's what we say. Mama Chari. He don't want to let go of the mother. He's always grabbing on, Mommy, 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 don't let me go. Hmm? That is love he's be, being pushed by. It's not because he just wants to be close to the food provider. No. Otherwise, he would immediately give her up as soon as he is fed. No, no, no. He has many more needs. He's a, he's a loving powerhouse, this little baby. It's just remains to be seen what he does with that love, how he develops, what is his Romeo and Julia story which was going to develop from that urge inside of him, or his religious search or whatever <coughs> uh, develops from that. But how in the world did he come on this planet? And how in the world he came to good? What happened? How did he choose this? Or how did he appear in a certain womb of a certain mother? This is absolutely amazing. And then on this planet, which floats somewhere in space. There was a beautiful poster once. Was space this magnification of <coughs> all the galaxies, and as you can imagine, as the Hubble telescope gives us, and there was one one little speck, speck, speck. There was a planet Earth, and there were two people talking on this planet, and they had like little bulbs where you like they do in the comic strips, no? And one said. We're just about to make history. Hmm? And the other one said, are you really sure about that? So what is our history? What is our love story? Isn't it lost in space? Is it not simply something so insignificant that it doesn't even worse to talk about? But then if we don't talk about it, we have nothing else to talk about. That would leave us in another problem. All of us quiet, silence, bored, totally fried because we have nothing to talk about. So, how did we get into this planet? How did this planet came to exist to begin with? Where did this space come from? And now, quantum physics says that your conscious unit is beyond time and space. That must really space you out. Me, beyond time and space, beyond the sun, beyond the moon, beyond the planet Earth, me, my consciousness, my, my conscious unit, that's how large, that's how great the soul is. Well, that's what the Bhagavad Gita says. The Bhagavad Gita says that our soul is beyond. At that 5,000 years ago on this planet Earth, the greatest thinker, philosopher, messenger, prophet, avatar, Lord, however you want to call him, he came and he said that. And he said a lot of more things. If you want to study the science of the soul, you have an easy job. Just read. But read it, really. Don't glance at it like you do at everything today. Just go like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not for me. No, read the Bhagavad Gita. It 
It's the manual of the lost soul. It tells you where you come from. It tells you where you can go. It tells you why you're here. It tells you what is the incompatible combination of spirit and matter. How it came about and what's the purpose and what's the rules to the game. What is the truth, what is the law and what is love. What is that love? What is that thing in us which makes us ourself, which makes us real, or let's say which makes us really interesting. Because if somebody has no love, he's not very interesting. What's the most beautiful thing the human beings have? Can you tell me? Focus. suggestions. What makes a person beautiful? Smile. <laughs> Who said it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the smile. With a stone face, you don't look very beautiful. Even you may look aesthetically okay, but without a smile, you look like a kind of strange guy. <laughs> But even if you are 80 years old and you have this bright ear-to-ear -ear smile, you become the most huggable, lovable, likable person. You become somebody who, oh. The smile is an expression of love. It means a feeling is thing. I mean, there's false smiles also, okay? But I'm not talking about that. Hmm? I'm talking about the sincere expression the heart-to-heart -heart readiness. I am ready to open myself towards you. A smile means an invitation. You don't smile at somebody and then tell them, get out of here. Right? A smile means come in. <laughs> come into my heart. And this is a very special thing. It's an opening. It's <coughs> Even Lord Krishna smiles. When he smiles, he's called Smita Krishna. So, this Lord of Love has given us the path of love, the teachings of love, the music of love, the philosophy of love, the loving exchanges, the signs of different type of loving relationships. He is living within that love and he is giving us the meaning. There's a one other word for that, this love, it is called rasa. Rasa, it's not only love, but it entails relationship. Rasa means a, a relationship based on pure feeling for one another. Without purity, rasa is perverted. Of course, there exists many perverted relationships, but we are not interested in them. We have suffered enough of them. Spiritually, in the, in the science of consciousness, rasa, here it is, it says, love relationships in transcendence. means love relationship beyond time and space or of the nature to be beyond time and space. Because when I say beyond time and space, doesn't mean that it has nothing to do with our current situation within time and space. That is the incompatible, surprising situation that we are conscious units within the world of matter. And this incompatible combination comes to its climax when 
the body is worn out and ends incapable of supporting further presence of the conscious unit, technically called death. Then you're kind of out of here. So, makes the whole thing so, so adventurous. Pass of love is the greatest, if not the only adventure. Just like I was talking with one young man yesterday in Germany. And this young fellow, only 23 years old, had already climbed four times in his life the Aconcagua, which is the highest of all mountains in America, in the Andes. It's after the Mount Everest range, the second highest peak on planet Earth. So this boy, he went four times up there, he's 23 years. Then I told him, it's about time that you climb the mountain of the ego. That is the highest of all peaks, and the most difficult to pick up. And much different than to the mountains. You climb up, put a flag, and come down, and you said, I was there. Nowadays you take a picture, no? But then you're down again. And it's a memory of that site, of the 360 degree. Uh, amazing uh, landscape. But the mountain of the ego is very difficult to climb and if you really want to be victorious in that climbing you have to stay up there on top of it. There's no coming down. Because the mountain of the ego is that identity in us which keeps us sidetracked, which keeps us disturbed from the real purpose. As long, now, now comes the real issue, as long as you are under the influence of the mountain of ego, you cannot fully love. Your loving potential cannot develop, and thus you will be inclined toward perverted love relationships. You will be inclined towards committing mistakes, and you will be inclined to feel lost. Like most people in this people world, they feel so lost because they have not tackled that mountain of the ego. They're just somewhere all the way down, maybe a little bit on the side, and have tried to climb it. And to understand the nature of this mountain of the ego, and where does that come in from, comes from? Well, basically it comes from the identification with the temporary body. You see, if you return to the original description how actually whatever's combination of matter incompatible for the soul but it is like your package your your physical body your physical your mental mind your intellectual intelligence and your highly compact subtly ego all this together creates a little monster of somebody who thinks I'm German, I'm African, I'm male, I'm female, I'm Christian, I'm atheist, I'm this, I'm that, I'm pretty, I'm skinny, I'm fat, bald-headed, I'm whatever. All these false observations, assumptions, uh, descriptions, they're all egos. And they're all false egos. Because with your loving urges in your heart, they 
have nothing to do. They're completely separate from them. You're not this body because the body's going to die. You're not young and handsome. You're going to be old and brittle. You're not this and you're not that. You're not even your teeth. You know, the teeth are the hardest thing you have in your body. And those just fall out at some point. Or, or worse, you have to pull them out because they're pain so much. So, everything in this body is not you. Not even your mind. Your flickering, troublemaking mind. It's not you. The mind tells you one thing, another thing. Oh my goodness, this mind keeps us always busy, always in some kind of torture, and always demanding things. The mind is such a silly fellow. He's always like, he's telling the intelligence, come on, be my order supplier. My eyes want glasses. My tongue wants chocolate. My ear wants Pink Floyd. My touch wants to have uh, some musical instrument. The mind's always telling you, give him, give him, give him, work, 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 get, 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 get. And the body is working together with the mind, the intelligence is behind, trying to supply all these ideas with the practical solutions, how to accomplish them. And finally you get them and the senses are again unsatisfied. I mean, what have you not done for your senses already? Always you were hard-working, such a surrendered guy to your sensual demands. So in this way, mind, intelligence, ego, senses, it's all a complete... like a conspiracy against your soul. It's all ego-motivated. It's all... Profit, adoration, and distinction. Me, I, mine. Well, sorry to say I'm a little better than you. Hmm? Besides, I'm older, and maybe wiser, and maybe richer, and maybe this, and maybe that, and maybe nothing. Maybe I'm just more puffed up. That's most likely. You know, everybody finds a reason to think why he's better than others. That's the function of the ego. The ego especially hounds the unknown. Whoever is not known, not familiar to me. Strange fellows. Away from me, far, far, far. And thus we create all kind of obnoxious isms and torture our soul and other souls with our isms. And follow those isms and sacrifice ourselves for our isms and not understanding what love is at all. There's no love in isms. There's only fanatism. There's only uh, misunderstandings. So to, to climb the mountain of the ego is a big affair. It's really what's called self-realization in India, is the climbing on the mountain of the ego. And you may slip many times on the way. It's very steep. Hmm? Have you seen those free climbers on the rocks? Hmm? Almost, almost your heart stops when you see them hanging there on a cliff there. I tell you, it's a big, difficult job, this free climbing, but to climb the, climb the mountain of the ego, sometimes it seems to be more difficult. <laughs> the ego doesn't want you to get up there. Because the ego is your conditional, it's like the, it's like the, the question, are you honest or are you a criminal? Even the criminals, they want to create a philosophy like Robin Hood, why they're not really criminals. Because it's a good illusion, because they are criminals. And according to the material existence, we are all pretty much criminals, in one way or another.
because we are worshipping our own ego and we think indirectly or directly and we have the right to subjugate others, to give trouble to others in order to enhance our own position. That's what egos do. Egos are nasty. Egos attack even family and friends. Ego attack your own parents. Ego, ego is, is, it doesn't have any resistance for doing nonsense. Therefore, the ego is in our way when it comes to real love. The ego, the false ego, it is our conditional existence. And in that conditional existence, we concoct ideas which will be satisfying to our loving craving. That's perversion. It's like you have a beautiful wife, you're married and so on and so on. And apparently you are in a good shape. But your ego will say, no, I should have another one. Another one. Why only have one? I'm so great. And you will feel like This is what's missing. I'm still not happy. Of course you're not happy with your wife. Neither is your wife happy with you. Why? What's wrong? Well, because you're not loving and she's not loving when it comes down to the unconditional love. You're both in the ego world. She wants to be number one and you want to be number one. You want her to do more and you enjoy more. And she wants you to do more, and she wants to enjoy more. And now you're in a kind of a competition. You see how you hack it out. And besides that, you are so conditioned that you are not really very loving. Usually the complaint in couples is that they don't feel being treated very lovingly. So then you think, oh, number one, it wasn't really enough, so maybe if I have another one. And then a third one, and then a fourth one. This is this dissatisfaction because the, even though the mind asks you for more and you supply it to them, you're never happy. Why? Because your soul demands love beyond time and space. You see, in all this description which I have given to you till now, I have not even mentioned the name God. I have not mentioned the secret of our existence. Where in the world does this individual unit come from? You. Where do you come? Most wondrous of all creatures. I mean, you're more wondrous even than a monster. Why? Because you look so nice and you're so potentially kind. I mean, if you would be looking like a monster, that would maybe a little bit more strange. But, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be so strange that so many monsters in this world, you know. But you are more wonderful because you're not a monster. You are a very loving individual unit. You have a loving potential. You have a loving craving. You have a loving need. You... You're ready to sacrifice for your love. You're even ready to reflect on your conditioning. You're even ready to climb up the mountain of the ego, even though it's a hard climb. Even that, you are kind of willing. If not, you would have already walked out from this room. You said, what is this guy talking about? I have to climb a mountain inside of myself. And it's very hard. No. You see, everything I say is not from me, it's, it's what I learned from my spiritual master. It's very reasonable. It's totally rational from the need of our life. 
<coughs> so all your accumulation of experiences and sensual exploits, they're not worth it. They're just a waste of time. And because of that waste of time, you have wasted a lot of time. And you feel like that. After you wasted time, you feel morose. But according to the understanding of the soul, there's unlimited time for you. So you better figure out what's the right use of your time, because all the time is there. And as long as you want to exploit time for selfish material temporary gains, you remain confined by space and time. That's exactly what brings you in the material world. That's what confines you here. That you want to enjoy space and time matter, so to say. Therefore, you cannot go beyond space and time. But your soul, your potential, your beauty, your wondrous existence is actually spiritually and scientifically beyond space and time. Now, let's approach that. Let's make the quantum jump into that, if you're ready. If you're ready, if you're agreeing, yes, we should. We have to make that. doesn't matter how much it takes, how difficult it may be. <laughs> what is that beyond things, space and time? This is the soul's world. This is the world of Atman in Sanskrit. Atman. In Latin, Alma, in university we say Alma Mata, place of the soul, for the search of the soul. But they don't study about the soul in the university. But this soul, this beautiful being, which is you yourself, that has all the power of love intrinsically hidden within. And that powerhouse of love is like something you may call the, the link with the original powerhouse of love. We are powerful, we are wonderful, but we are not the original. None of us is the creator of love. None of us is the originator of love. And none of us can reciprocate to our own love. You can love yourself. We try. I mean, one great scholar said, if we would love God as we love ourselves, we'll already be a pure devotee. Already be of the greatest degree. But even our love for ourselves is not that satisfying, otherwise nobody would kill himself. <coughs> hmm? So there is a frustration with ourselves. You know, we love our looks, we love our voice, we love our creative ideas, we love so many things, we love our mother, we love our land and everything, but we are not, never fully satisfied. So it's not sufficient. So. But this still, it's an investment. Something was invested in us, like, like an injection, like your batteries were charged. But actually, this, this what is your heart looking for? What is this intense impulse within you? It will only find satisfaction by connecting with its origin. Supreme power. Just like these electric bulbs are connected to the powerhouse of energy. Otherwise, they'd just be pitch dark here. You wouldn't have a light, or a little bit coming from the sun still. But uh, the powerhouse connection is very important. Now, in the, in the case of love, you have to connect to the universal powerhouse of love. How do you do that? Now it's getting tough because your ego will rebel. Ooh, now you will really get trouble. But I think you will be <coughs>
capable of surviving. The first step of connecting with the powerhouse of life is embracing the universal principle of love. Which means you have to be ready to love everyone. Even your enemies. Of course, actually, you don't have enemies. There were just some mistakes you did and others did because you were on the wrong track. Actually, you have no enemies. You have nothing to do. You don't have enemies and you don't really have friends either. It's just like you say, I have a house. Come on, you have a house, you must be joking. You'll be gone next moment and that thing falls apart and becomes again, you know, somebody made a calculation, how long it would take nature to again make all those cities back into nature. Uh, maybe 50 years, you know, I've seen that, the jungles overgrowing houses there. <laughs> You've seen Angkor Wat, famous, famous shrines from the Kuma, uh, culture that was the biggest biggest temple buildings and they're all grown overgrown by by big trees <coughs> so to think that you have something in this world or you are somebody in this world is just another illusion you have to embrace first step universal love and do you know what that means my friend Number one, no more killing of enemies. Absolutely. Not one single living entity can you kill unless it is an unavoidable thing. Sometimes, like, you cannot avoid everything. <laughs> but no animal shall be killed willfully by you, neither any tree or plant unless there's a real need for it. You can't go out and just cut trees and think you're going to love God and love the, and have connection with the Supreme Powers. Also. No. No way. Now you learn how to hug trees and how to care for animals and what to speak of humans. <laughs> First lesson in universal love. First lesson in contacting love beyond time and space. Understanding that the same loving principle is behind every one of us. It's the underlying principle of life itself. It's love supreme. And it, nobody can be excluded from it. Whoever wants to exclude the one or the other from it, disqualify himself. Is that possible to love everybody? Well, great saintly persons and messengers of love have said yes. Not only that, they have shown us how to do it. They have given us a practical example. How can you love? Live loving everyone. So it's a, it's a task. You can start today. If you are not vegetarian until today, today you make your commitment. Yes, I want to connect the powerhouse of love. And I'm open for universal love to manifest within me. I want that. Then when you open your heart to this universal love beyond time and space, to the powerhouse, it's not under your control, but you can open yourself. It has to be sanctioned from above. This is another power or the secret of consciousness. Consciousness can collapse matter situation. But only higher consciousness can intervene in your consciousness. In other words, you have to accept another big difficult job that somebody is in charge above me. Mm -hmm. That pains. Because in the material world we always want to be in control. We always want to be the master. 
the master of my children, the master of my wife, the master of my employees, the master of my citizens. Even in, even in the friendship circles, we try to be more master than the other. Always we are trying to encroach on others. Now the second, second, after universal love, after loving everyone, now the second lesson comes to connect to the powerhouse of love. My acceptance that I depend on His grace. That means above my consciousness, my conscious unit of minute quantity, there is a higher conscious unit which can accept me and grant mercy upon me and make me an instrument of His love because it's His love, not my love, which is my power. Yes, He gave me that power. He gave me some of that love, but it is His love. And when you accept that, when you come to the second lesson of this loving research and study, there's one more. And this is very confidential. And that is what is actually called us. That is, not only is there a powerhouse of love beyond you, higher than you. Not only is there such a wonderful thing, but you can fall in love with him. You can have a personal attachment towards him. And through him, intense to everybody. And through him, whatever comes through him. This is the world of divine faith. Because as consciousness is the all underlying principle of everything, Hans Peter Dürer goes as far, the quantum physicist, as to say that matter does not really exist. It is simply a reduced stage of consciousness. Because that's pretty abstract, no? But let it be as it be. But you are a conscious unit, and you are a matter of the a member of the conscious world, and you are not in charge. You are depending on grace from the conscious world. Even embracing universal love is not within your capacity. You can only appeal. Pray for it. You can ready yourself for it. Even in the material world, I mean, if you just want to fall in love with, you can feel loving, loving attraction towards a particular person. But that person has a right to say, yes, you can come closer. And the person can also say, get lost. I don't want to see you. Why? That's all. I don't owe you even an explanation. Just get lost. <laughs> so, even in the material sphere, your consciousness is 100% dependent on the approval of another conscious unit for having any type of loving exchange. So, how do you think that in the original powerhouse connection you'll be in charge and you'll be in control? You're not. So you have to humble down. You have to eat the humble pie. <laughs> First you climb up on this mountain of ego, and then you eat a bunch of humble pie. And then all these things start growing within you, and you start feeling ecstasy. I mean real ecstasy, not this silly drug. They're selling to the poor kids out there in the in the in the in the techno fest. <laughs> Your soul is potentially ecstatic. 
That's what the scriptures say. You're born from the ocean of love and you're meant to taste that love. But you have to go that hard, windy road up to finding the treasure inside of your soul, which is all the way there on top of the ego mountain to be found. <laughs> And then you are free. Then you will understand everything. Just like on top of the mountain you can say, now I understand what's going on here around here. <laughs> but you still don't know what's going on above you. <laughs> There's a lot of more things going on above you despite having mounted the, the ego. Because your ego isn't that big after all. <laughs> So this is the secret of real love. It comes by understanding the true nature of my soul, the true nature of life, the true nature of everything. And if you want to enter into this domain and stay there, like I said, get up to this mountain, but don't come down afterwards. Don't return to the conditional world of egotism. Then you will find rasa. Then loving relationship will develop. And there will be so wonderful those loving relationships. So amazingly wonderful that they make your life worth living. And they make your death worth dying. Because it's beyond time and space, so what the heck? We have to die, so let's die with graceful appreciation of whatever.